Do you know what? Right now, as we think about the Lion of Judah, we so often think of him as the lion, and we're almost like his followers. But do you know what? Those that follow the lion are lions themselves. It actually says in Scripture that those that behold him and look at him, do you know what? We're being transformed into his image. So we know that the image of the lion, the lion of Judah is Jesus. But I've got news for you, church. If you're a follower of Jesus, there is something about the lion in you that needs to be awoken. I started week one last week and I, you know, we saw an amazing response and it was like it landed. Some people were a bit sort of in shock. They were in the headlights like little rabbits. It was like, oh my goodness, what is this? But do you know what? God wants to disturb our quietness. He wants to dis- uh, disturb our civilized behavior. We were never meant to be as believers. We were never meant to be civilized or sterile. There was meant to be something risky about you. And I'm going to speak into that today. So I hope you're ready. Um, you know, you can uh, engage, you can respond, whatever location you're in. doesn't matter what size you are. This is about the size of your heart. So you ready? Here we go. I want to start off because I mentioned this last, last week. A picture of a lion. And do you remember I mentioned, we, we all have this sort of idea of this like perfect lion, the image of a perfect lion. He's, yeah, he's normally male, uh, but he's a, and in that he's got like a nice mane. You see it on the movies, you know, when he turns around and roar. You know when he does the roar? It's like the old movies, they do that thing. And uh, it's like, he's just so perfect. But we were pointing out before that when they're perfect, when, when they seem almost like they've been groomed, you groom domestic cats. You don't groom wild lions. And so when we look at this picture of the lion, you see he's got a great big gash out of his, like, you know, below his eye. It's like, you know, he's, he's been fighting for something. Maybe, I don't know, maybe that was like some uh, animal antelope that he had to pursue when he got kicked in the face. There was risk of having his skull broken. See, you don't think about that with lions. You don't think that every time they go out to hunt, they risk their life because one broken bone means probably death. And here he is, there's like a scar, there's blood, you see. And we, see, you've got to realize that we're part of a blood religion. Right, right from the beginning, they were shedding a blood for, for sin, for covering Adam and Eve. And if you're not into blood, I got new, the, Christian, the Christian gospel is all about the blood of Jesus that was given for us, right? That it canceled out our debt and our sin. It was through his blood that was spilled that we can actually come and have church here freely. We don't have to come through a priest come through a confession moment box, but we can come before the throne with boldness. Why? Because the righteous are as bold as lions. Oh, so it's something to do with righteousness and boldness and lions. Because you've got to know who you are, but enough of the church don't know who they are. They don't understand this picture of the lion. It's more like this, they're fat cats. We got fat cats chilling out in fat cat land. It's like in church, you, you will find so many, and, and I'm sure I'm speaking to some people today, you're a fat cat in our church, you need to sort yourself out. It's like, what have you got served up for me today? Do I like this subject or do I find it a bit convicting? Do I find it a bit disturbing? And it's like, we got, you know, fat cats hang out with other fat cats. It's like, there's, there's just like fat cats that are overfed, so big, they're not going out hunting. Interesting thing as well is, do you know they lose their sex drive? And you might think, what's that to do with the message? But we were, we were called to be fruitful church. And you will find at the heart of every unfruitful church are fat cats. You lost your ability and desire to reproduce. Because we want to sit back and we want to have like that next bit of message and that next podcast. In fact, some of us like feed on five a week. You don't need that, guys. You just need to take hold of some of the truth that's already in your life and start putting into action. It will change the world. But we just think a little bit more, another word, another prophetic thing, another worship moment. We just think that, hey, and if things, if I get answers to prayer, the fat cat's going to be happy. Please feed me. Please stroke me. In fact, I don't even need to go outside because everything is here for me. So I want to speak to you about perspective. It's all a question of perspective. Because why are some of us fat domestic cats sitting around for our next meal, our next stroke, and if we don't get stroke, we go somewhere else. And some of us have got scars from fighting, and we got skin in the game. Do you remember? Skin in the game. 
there's a cost. There's something it cost us. It's all around perspective. See, perspective really defined is just a way of thinking. And it's like from a certain standpoint, often from what I've experienced. So your perspective right now, as I speak to you about lions, will be, um, there'll be, it will be coming from your experience, from your background, from what, perhaps you've had a bad experience of church life. Perhaps you've had a bad experience of leadership. Do you know your, pers- your perspective when someone says, step up, <laughs> when someone comes and says, hey, we, we, need, we need like help on our volunteer team here. We need you to get involved. It's like, hey, I've, I've seen how people get, they get hurt. I don't want any of that like bruising on my face. In fact, I'm going to sit here like a fat cat and let you do it all. Call me just a consumer cat. And uh, you see, this, this is what happens. It's like, this is all perspective. And uh, it works this way. Uh, you'll often hear it. It's like, perspective is from my experience, from my up, upbringing, is that this glass is half full. Or is it actually half empty? And we could probably split the room that you're in right now between those where you ask a few questions. Do you see risk or do you see opportunity? Because I know lions see opportunity. <laughs> Do you have a, all of us have a, a money attitude? And either you think there is not enough to go around, which doesn't make us generous, it makes us fearful and quite tight. That's the way we live our life. Be careful. And maybe that's because we came from a place where there wasn't enough. Or we have the attitude that there's more than enough because we serve a God who knows what generosity is. It doesn't mean to say we're all going to have loads and loads of cash. What it means is generosity is birthed in your heart. Generosity is birthed in your heart. When lions make a kill, they do it together and they eat together. <laughs> it's not for the glory of one. It is for. It's for the pride. It's for all. Whatever it takes, you see, whatever it takes. And your perspective will be, well, I'm just going to have my own little life going on here because I can't be doing with that. You just need to be, like, just don't be so naive. You can't trust people because they could turn around. It's because of what you've been through. See, perspective, it changes everything. It changes the way you go forward. It changes the way you're going to see things happen through the potential of your life. So we all have them, but the trouble is, is they're blind spots because we, we don't all realize them. They're actually very natural to us. It's, it's like normal. It's like, well, no, isn't that the way everyone thinks? And you get around other lions, and then you start thinking, oh my goodness, the way I think is perhaps not normal. I'm living a, living a lesser life because there's something cynical born within me because of resentment. He hasn't called you to be a coper. He's called you to be a conqueror. And yet it's all a matter of perspective. And that will make the difference of how we receive through this message. So I'm going to use some scripture here from Numbers. So we're going way into the beginning of the Bible, into the Old Testament, Numbers. We're going in like the Israelites. They've, they've come out from captivity of the Egyptians and they're sort of in the, in the desert. They're in the wilderness. And uh, what happens is Moses sends the spies. He sends the spies to what the promised land because God has made a promise. Great picture for all of us. It's like there's, there's this promise for every one of you. There's something greater. Your best days yet to come. The promise is there. The promise. The grapes are there. See, there, there's something about it's there, but you're going to need to go there. And if you're sleeping lying, you'll never go there. You've got to go there. And so we pick up this story in Numbers 13, 27 to 28. I'm going to pull out a few verses just to, to show you something. Because the spies go out and they come back with a report. Every one of you has the ability to make a report. You will go away from today and make a report. You know, oh, well, it was either, yeah, that, that was okay, or, you know, I'm, I'm perhaps going to have a little think about that, which means you're going to do nothing with it, or you're going to, like, say, no, some expo- I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to l- act more like a lion. There's like a response, and a response is demanded. So here's the story in Numbers 13, 27, 28. They gave Moses this account when they returned. We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. It's amazing. Here's its fruit. They were like massive. Two men took took to just carry a bunch of grapes. They were like melons. But the people, see, but 
But see, we see the fruit. We, many of us have seen the promise. We've seen what's good, but it's almost like it's out of touch. It's like, but, but although it's so amazing and the promise is true and it's for us, you should see what stands against us. The people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there, which are the giants. So we're talking about giants. It's like, this land's full of giants. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the promise. Did you realize you left it with giants in? <laughs> See, the domestic cat wants to enter the promised land without any giants. We're like busy waiting on the border of something greater until God does something about the giants when he's saying, no, actually, it's you that needs to go and defeat the giants. See, it's a, it's a way, it's a perspective, it's a way of thinking. And they had this, for a moment, they came back and these spies came back. And when they came back, they had an agreement that, hey, it's true, it's there. But do you know what? We're, we're not prepared to pay the cost. That's what they must have decided. And there was 10 that came back with a, pos- with a, a negative report, two with a positive. And, and here they are. See, the, see this negativity in numbers. There's like agreement. And there's power here. And they come back and they say, do you know what, Moses? What they're saying is, we get free food. Because they had like, they'd experienced miracles. They had manna drop from, from, from heaven. They've experienced all this. So it was like, we prefer to be fed tin food like domestic cats do rather than go out and pursue the prey that God has for us and I want to ask that question every one of of, of you (laughs) do you want to carry on having the tin food that is processed Christianity or do you want to have the wild meat of the gospel that will change your life you got to be careful because with the latter one there's risk with the first one you can remain domesticated and when you want something, you can go up and, you know, you can like purr and stroke all you want up against the pastor or Jesus, whoever you want. And you know how cats do that when they want something? They're the nicest things ever, but when they've got what they want. And then you put your hand out. We had one like this. You put your hand out, it's like, rah, rah. But when they want something, they're like these like split personality. It was like demonic. And that's like when we want something, guys, with God, we're up there purring up against him. It's, Lord, I'll do anything for you, Lord. Lord, just answer this prayer. Lord, just move in my son's life right now. Lord, will you deliver me of this situation? And then you sort of speed forward. And then a year later where you saw miracles, you saw amazing provision. And now it's like, hey, God, I'm just too busy with my own life right now. I just don't know what that church is going on about when it talks about commitment. Hey, give me a break. I just want to like have some time to myself right now. I got my miracle. I got my tin food. And God is coming to disturb you because that's not who he called you to be. See, the enemy will placate you. Not every answer to prayer is a blessing. So anyway, let's go back to the story. Verse 30 to 33. Then Caleb, see, he's one of the great guys. Caleb silenced the people before Moses like, I've had enough of the negativity. And this is his perspective. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. See, the two opposites. They're on the same mission. We could do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, hey, shut up with you. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread this among the Israelites. A bad report about the land that they'd explored. If you've got negativity in your heart... If you want to take a risk, you'll spread a bad report so others will agree with you, which will make you happier. Then you can stay in Hakuna Matata. We, we as human beings have got this incredible gift of like going to look for people who will agree with our perspective. We like hanging out with those with our perspective. It's like, do you know, it's like, yeah, I knew I was right. I had to ask five people before I got there, but I found someone that agrees. In fact, I Googled it. And I found an opinion that agreed with me wow. about tithing. I knew I was right. You just give me tin food. Oh, wow. Come on. And here they are. The bad report spreads. That's why you've got to watch out for it because it spreads. It spreads. It runs around the track twice as quick as a good report. Wow. That's why in the New Testament we say, church, 
be bearers of the good report. Good report. Doesn't mean to say everything's kushti. What it, what it means is I'm going to focus on the good report. The good report. The good report will come from my mouth. Because we'll go on to see what happens. Because 40 days, right? They went into the promised land 40 days. They saw what it had to offer. It had the grapes, it had the goodness, the milk and the honey. And it had the grapes, the, the giants. So you had the goodness, you had the giants. And uh, from it, they had 40 days. So they came back. Two different perspectives. And they chose, because the bad report, they chose. They chose to believe the bad report. 40 days turned into 40 years. Your bad report might make you feel good for today, but it's going to kill you in 40 years. You might have a great opinion about theology and other stuff, but you know what? It's designed to trap you. Legalism will trap you. 40 years, you can still talk about it, but no one's even listening. It's actually your passion you will be remembered for. Not your opinions. And all these guys who had an opinion died off. 40 years. Whole gener- uh, 40 years it took. This, this is a challenge to you all. I want to encourage you, church. Some of you are in danger of staying as sleeping lions. Some of you, are, uh, you're in danger of remaining a domestic cat and never fulfilling the potential God has, never entering the promised land. So you can live on the edge. You can live on the border, but never enter the fullness they don't tell me, hey, I believe in Jesus and I've got a great relationship with him. Yeah, you're living on the edge. And this is to encourage the very best that God has. Because what happened, those guys, what, what made the bad report spread? They turned from gratitude of being set free from slavery into grumbling. Gratitude went to grumbling. Grumbling comes from entitlement. Entitlement will make you domesticated. Well, I just feel I deserve it. You don't see lions say that who are out in the wild. They're not going around going, oh, I can't believe there's no meat today. Where's the zebra? I just feel like, you know, I just feel like we've been coming here for a long time now. We've like given a lot into this land. Where's the zebra? Where's the zebra? It's like we're going to pursue. There's something about pursuing the heart of the pursuer. See, entitlement is something that will, it will kill you off. We do it so easily. See, our disappointment expectations linked to entitlement. And if you're discouraged right now, or you've picked up some like, you just got some like issues, and it's like, oh, I, you know, I, I know that even here, I've come into freedom, but I just know, you know, there's, there's some issues here. There's, if you want to look for issues, you're going to find them. You search for anything long enough, you're going to find it. If you want to have a bad attitude, you're going to find it. If you want to find something to live for, you're going to find it. If you want to find something to be brave about, you're going to find it. If you want to find something to give your life for bigger than yourself, you're going to find it. But entitlement will rob that away. Over the years of pastoring, we have seen like this pattern. You see people arrive in our church, wherever that is, if it's in Chennai, India, if it's in Simrip, Cambodia, if it's in Rotterdam, Netherlands, wherever, that, wherever it is, it's the same pattern because people are the same. And what happens is they, they come in and at the beginning, there is something about, wow, you know, Oh, it just blew me away today. Do you know what? And, and the worship. Oh, guys, you have got amazing worship. Do you know what? We have been in a desert. We've been in a barren place. Do you know what? We've been in, and, and we walked in to your church. Do you know what you guys have got? And we're going, yeah. And we'll fight you for it. <laughs> and there is something you see about this thing of like, yeah, we, there's, we're a healthy church, not a perfect church. We got vision and we're not staying still. See, we're reproducing lions. And people come in and it's like the first couple of years, it's like, oh yeah, I'm so excited about volunteering and, you know, just, oh, the word, you know, there's something about the word and you get all these things. And they're always like, all right, let's just give it a couple of years. And then we sort of speed along two years time. And then I'm hearing from that past, from that location, oh yeah, we've got some like just challenges at the minute. They've got this couple that are really not happy with the way we do things, not happy with the way, you know, our, our groups are, I'm not happy about, you know, this and there's like this list. And then a few weeks later, sometimes it's like, oh, they've decided that, oh, freedom's not really for them. Are they, are these the same people that came with a heart of gratitude that stepped into something 
and then now are walking away, grumbling, complaining, because the manna and the miracle became common, and we forgot what gratitude was, and we ended up in a place where we just thought, hey, I'm entitled to more right now. And guys, we need to watch that all of us are susceptible to it. Your heart can be great today, but where will it be tomorrow? What you focus on forms your gratitude. So we've got to watch out, guys, because fear is the cancer of faith. And when these guys came along and they went and looked in the land, they saw the giant, something grabbed hold of them. I think it's, hey, we need to play it safe. We need to just make sure that we're not going to die. Let's stay in our domesticated situation. And I believe they forgot who they are. They forgot... They were almost like thinking more slave-like rather than lion-like. So I think, why 40 years? Why 40 years that it took that long? Like, it's amazing. It took 40 years for them to really get through this whole site. It'd be great. God, could you, like, fix this situation sooner? But no, the issue was within the hearts of the people. And you see, these warriors, because these were the warriors that would have gone in and taken the promise, they were called for it. They became warriors. God has called every follower of Jesus Christ to be a warrior, whether you feel like it or not. He's put courage within your DNA, whether you know it or not. Have I got my assistant? Is he handy here? Josh, are you here? Yes. So I'm just going to invite Josh. Welcome, Josh, to the stage. Here he is. Josh works behind the scenes a lot, and he's an incredible uh, server in our church. He's like busy making things happen, but today we, we got you here on stage because there's, there's something great about him, right? So now, Josh, this guy, he's five foot one, right? Just over 1.5 meters. Five foot one. Now, probably through school and everything else, you've probably had a lot of jokes about how tall or short you are. And yet, if I was to pick you up and place you in Cambodia, because in Cambodia, the average height is five foot. They're some of the shortest people in the world. (laughs) But when you go to Cambodia, when I go there, they're all like you. And this is the point. In fact, you're one inch taller, so you're like, you're above the average. (laughs) But this is the point, right? When you hang out with people of the same size, you're all tall. It's a case of perspective. But you see, when we hang out with people, some of the tallest people are average six foot foot tall. You're going to feel short. Where you hang out will determine your identity. And you see, it's so funny, because when you lose vision and decide to hang out as a lion with pigs, you soon think you're a pig. You're not a pig. (laughs) But it's amazing how you can go, you can change your situation, and you can walk away from your current situation, and suddenly you're walking thinking, I'm actually looking down on some people. Because you walked into a place that made you feel like, oh, well, this is the new norm. And this happens to every one of us spiritually, right? You can be in a good place, but you can walk. And just by walking and making poor decisions, just like we saw in the Bible, we end up in a place where we look. And it's like, actually, everyone agrees with me. We're all the same height. You are tall in the land of Cambodia. Amen. Thanks, Josh. So going back to the scripture, I, I, I want you that to sink in because we live like that. We'll get around opinions that agree with us because then it makes us feel normal. But if you hang around with lions, it can be challenging. You hang around someone with passion and you're not a very passionate person, it can be challenging. But if you hang out with the unpassionate people, you're all passionate. Oh, we're all passionate. Is it? 
Yeah, because you're hanging around with people with commonality. So finishing off this uh, scripture here, it says, they said the land we explored, it devours those living in it. All the people we saw there of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. These were the, uh, the giants. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we looked the same to them. So they had this opinion that we're the grasshoppers, they're the giants. See? See the, diff- the perspective. And the enemy wants to constantly make you feel like you're the grasshopper in your situation. You're believing for a breakthrough. The situation where you feel like I'm being overwhelmed, it's like you're a grasshopper. You just better stay there right now. And yet there's something you see going on in the background that is happening. Guys, if you hang out with people with no vision, you will feel wonderful. I've, I've seen people with great vision like we've, we've seen them in, in our church, a great vision, great potential. But through getting a bad heart and a bad attitude, they've wandered into the camp of the pigs. And what's happened is, is they start to then feel, actually, I feel better about myself because I haven't been feeling so good about myself lately. Why? Because there's conviction on your life that is saying, don't you sacrifice what you were called for. But when you hang out with those that did sacrifice what they were called for, you start to think, actually, I feel pretty good about myself because others feel the same. And you can hang out and a year will go by in two years. And I've seen a generation lost because they decided to hang out because they got fed up with the challenge that God ultimately put on their life. They decided to hang out with those with no vision. Without vision, people perish. This is where it's coming from. See, there's contention in your calling. Whoever thought your calling would be simple or easy. I, I believe that to the day that I die, I'm going to be contending for something. There's no retirement from this faith. I'm going to be contending for something. But do you know what? There's comfort in retreat. And comfort will make you the domestic cat. And you can live out your retirement on tin food. We're all vulnerable to it. So back to the story, okay, we're, we're coming here, Numbers 14, 8 to 9, uh, this is what Caleb says, he speaks up, see this is the other perspective, if the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flown with milk and honey, and will give it to us, o- only do not rebel against the Lord, keep your hearts good, you've got to remember, keep your hearts good, do not be afraid of the people, because fear, you see, it's like this cancer that will just stop you, because we will devour them, oh, The grasshopper seems to have turned into the giant and the giant has become the grasshopper. See, this is what happens with your situation. If only you just listen to what it is to be a lion. See, the lion is roaring in your heart right now. It's roaring in your heart. There's something about the lion that roars and says, you've got to wake up. Their protection is gone, he says. It might be big, but their protection is gone. See, it's not about them. It's about who we are. It's about who you're called to be. But the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Don't give up. Don't be afraid of them. There's this picture here of, a, of two lions who were actually, the story is that they were starving and they were trying to like basically survive, feed their family. They don't normally do this, but they went for a giraffe. And two lions brought down this huge giraffe that was like running 50 miles an hour. It's like just this, like one kick would have like finished the lion. And they are pursuing and hunting the giraffe. I'm sorry, but the giraffe does die. It's the circle of life. (laughs) But we need to understand a bit of this. Is that there's something that's born in us as the church. Do you know what? We're called triers. One thing, I I haven't always succeeded, but one thing I want to always be able to do is I'm going to give it a try. You know, if if, if it feels like, hey, there's a big giant there, I'm going to give it a try. Now, I might die in trying, but I'm going to give it a try. It's better that I like at least try and die trying than actually not trying at all. And there's something about the church. You are called to be triers. Something in Freedom Church right now that we have part of our DNA. I believe it's it's this line of Judah. It's like, church, you've got to try. Can you change things? You've got to try. Can you go to that city in Raleigh, in the US, and a bunch of people change it? Yes, try. You've got to try. See, there's something about trying in our heart. Trying. And it's like, we're going to try. And these lions, they went after the kill. They went after the kill. 
wasn't like guaranteed success, no injury, but they were driven. They were driven to pursue. And what you choose to forget and remember is key to unlocking your potential. You've got to remember it. You've got to remember it. There was something about when Simba in the film Lion King, he's looking in the little pond, you know, he's in uh, Hakuna Matata and he's there and it's like, oh, we're just having fun, hanging out with pigs and eating grubs. And then he suddenly like has this like, Look, you need to look. You need to look and realize. You need to look in the mirror, church. You need to look in the mirror and say, is this, is this the person I once was? Is this the vision that I, that I had? Is this the lion speaking now, right? Or is it the one that feels like a failure? It's like there's, there's something about looking and as he looks in, there's this whole statement. And this is what I'm calling this message. It's like, Simba. <laughs> Simba, remember who you are. Right, and he gets up and he goes off. And we remember that's like, yes, and we're all there going, yes, there's a tear in the eyes, like remembers. And yet that's exactly the same for the church right now. I'm speaking to some people who need to remember who they are. You need to remember who you are. Church, you need to remember who you are because the enemy wants you to forget your identity through fear and challenge. Because once you forget your identity, you don't know who you are, you're going to walk around in the wilderness for 40 years. But when you remember who you are, you see, you go on the prowl. You get a taste for salvation. You get a taste that you can actually make this world a better place. You get a taste for hope and redemption. Oh, it's like, do you know, it's just like, I, I, I salivate when I just like think of those words. It's like, oh, there's the lion in me that actually makes me believe that I can be involved with it. And here he is, he gets up and he goes, see the trier, the trier. See, more people die through containment than they ever did through risk. More people in the church right now are dying through containment, being contained in the four walls of your church, the containment of your theology, the containment of being civilized, the containment of control, than ever dies through the risk that Jesus called you to live. But the enemy, see, he flips the perspective. Whoa, 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 play safe. And today, he's calling out to us. I'm going to finish with this scripture just real quick. Because this is right after, you see, they go in, they actually cross and they go into the promised land 40 years later. So zoom forward 40 years. They, here, here are the guys, Joshua 5, 2, 3. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haloth. I'm thinking, so they get in the promised land after all this time. These are the guys that didn't rebel and forgot who they were. These are the new Simbas. They're the new warriors. They've come, right? They've come, they've arrived. And they cross, they cross through the river. It's like, we're in the promised land. We made what our forefathers could never do. And we're here. But what happened is they'd really forgot who they were. And they weren't circumcised, which is part of the agreement that they had with the Lord. So as soon as they cross into enemy territory, not when the safe zone, when they're in the danger zone, when they're vulnerable, he says, right now, let's get some flint knives and all the men, all the warriors, right, we're, we're going to circumcise. We're going to have like this great festival day, circumcise day. And it says like for quite a long time, they couldn't, they couldn't move. They were vulnerable. If the enemy attacked then, they would have been defeated. But God was saying, put your trust in me. Don't, this isn't about the strength of men. This is about the strength that I put within you. And that strength comes from obedience, you see. It comes from obedience before you see the prize. Because he was setting them up. He was setting them up for what? Jericho. Jericho was the first giant. It was the giant. He was saying, hey, you've got to deal with your heart. Because circumcision, I mean, these guys talk about having skin in the game. It's like, we're, we're, it's like Joshua coming out saying, imagine your freedom. It's like, guys, I've got this new idea for ownership. We're all going to be circumcised. And it's like, they've got skin in the game. But when is it good, right? When's it good to lose some skin? When it means you won't lose your life. Lose your potential. Some of us are keeping things in our heart instead of having them cut away. 
there's a danger. There's a danger. It finishes here, Joshua 5, 7. So he raised up their sons, the sons of those that died in the wilderness. What? In their place, this new generation. And these were the ones Joshua circumcised. These were the raised generation that filled the place of those that never went. You have a choice. Freedom Church, every one of you, no matter what your age is, you can either step by and remain the domesticated cat or you can roar like a lion. And there's a roar that's coming because the actual thing is, is that God will raise up others if you don't step up. And the first thing he says is, but you've got to deal with your heart. You've got to deal with your heart. You've got to remember who you are. See, that's what he said. He said, remember who you are, church. Remember that the lion heart of Jesus is in you. It reigns within you. It is who we are. And you might not know it, but if you just listen, if you just listen in your heart, you're going to hear, you're going to hear a growl.